Welcome to all of you. I'm Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the third annual Africa Initiative for Governance lecture. The inaugural lecture, the inaugural AIG lecture was given by Professor Atahiru Jega, an eminent scholar and former Vice Chancellor of Bayero University, and very importantly, the former chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission in Nigeria, and the first one ever to oversee two elections, the elections of 2011 and 2015. The second AIG lecture was given by Justice Georgina Wood, the former Chief Justice of Ghana, the first ever woman to hold that position. She swore in each of Presidents Atta Mills, Mahama, and Akufo Addo in Ghana, and she also came to give the AIG annual lecture. And it's a huge pleasure to be hosting you all this evening for the third lecture in this series. But let me just explain that the lecture is made possible by the Africa Initiative for Governance, with whom we here at Oxford University in the Blavatnik School have had a long-standing now partnership, which we hugely value. The partnership provides scholarships for some of Nigeria's most brilliant public sector leaders to come and study at the school, but also to permit a fellow, an AIG fellow, to be selected each year as an exemplar of great public service. I'm going to turn in a moment to Mr. Aigboje Aikimukwede, the founder of the Africa Initiative for Governance. He founded the AIG in 2014. But let me just introduce him for a moment. Aigboje Aikimukwede was is the founder and chairman now of Coronation Capital. He has a long and very distinguished career in banking, in philanthropy, and in helping Nigeria's public sector. He's commander of the Order of Niger. He's won the National Productivity Order of Merit Award. He's been internationally awarded as Entrepreneur of the Year for Africa, as the African Bank of, of the Year in 2013. He's a member of the Am American Academy of Arts and Scientists, Sciences. Perhaps for us here in the Blavatnik School, most of all, he is a member of the International Advisory Board of Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government. And we are delighted to have his wisdom helping us chart the direction and strategy of the school in that role. One last thing I do want to say about Mr. Ike Imukwede is that particularly in this time of COVID is another area in which he's made an extraordinary contribution, not just to Nigeria, but to the world through his work in global health, tireless work as the first African co-chairman of the Global Business Coalition on Health, as a donor and friend of the Global Fund. Indeed, he's chairman of Friends of the Global Fund, has been in the past. He's currently chairman of ABC Health, a regional nonprofit in, in the region. He's director of a private sector health alliance of Nigeria. He's initiated an Adopt a Healthcare Facility program. He's vice chairman of Global Citizen Nigeria. And through a partnership with the Nigeria Sovereign Investment Fund, he's created the Nigeria Solidarity Support Fund. Nigeria. Nigeria is lucky to have Aikboje Aikimokwede, and we are hugely honored to have him as a partner with the Blavatnik School, helping us to help governments across the continent of Africa, but most particularly in Nigeria and in West Africa. So let me turn to Aikboje Aikimokwede to introduce tonight the third AIG annual lecture and the third AIG fellow, Aik. Thank you so much, Professor Naira Woods. And I will call and refer to Professor Woods as Naira from now on. Um, thank you for that extremely warm introduction. Thank you for opening our third annual fellowship lecture. Uh, but thank you most especially for the partnership that the Africa Initiative for Governance AIG enjoys with your great institution, the Blavatnik School of Government, which in under 10 years has become the premier, the uh, flag bearer 
or postgraduate um, pro-government focused studies. And I think that um, the work that you do around the world, but especially for Africa, in terms of improving the quality of governance across the public sector in Africa and beyond is exemplary. We're very proud to, to partner with you. Um, welcome to all on uh, a day that is very, very special to me. And I will tell you why in a few, in a few minutes. Uh, my job today is to introduce our guest lecturer, our guest speaker uh, to the audience. Uh, I will not um, speak too much about the Africa Initiative for Governance other than to say that our fellowships are not a reward for good service. They go much and way beyond that. We feel that these fellowships signal to Nigerians, to West Africans, to Africans, that for those individuals who contribute to humanity by virtue of their roles as public sector leaders, they must be celebrated. Our fellowships also provide an opportunity for these individuals to think through their work in a more relaxed setting at Oxford and use the Blavacnik School as a basis to explore further ways of adding value to public service in West Africa. In 2019, the Africa Initiative for Governance announced the appointment of Mrs. Ifueko Omorigi Okwaru, former executive chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue Service of Nigeria, FIRS, as a 2019-2020 AIG Visiting Fellow of Practice at the Blavatnik School of Government, University of Oxford. This appointment continues AIG's tradition of identifying West Africans who have exhibited outstanding performance in public service. And Nairi spoke to the two distinguished leaders of our continent who have occupied the role of visiting fellow of practice prior to Mrs. Omorigi Okwaru. Now, unlike Professor Jega and Justice Woods, I had never met them before their appointments. But if we're cool, who I am pleased to introduce to you, I know as not just an outstanding African, an outstanding female practitioner of excellence, but I would call her an outstanding sister as well. I knew her just about the time when I was getting well into my banking career, when I had joined Guarantee Trust Bank. And I speak to her uh, as a force of nature who in a strange way doesn't change because many of the things that struck me about Ifueko when I first met her 30 years ago still remain true till this minute that I speak about her. Some describe her as a strategic leader and a builder of sustainable institutions. She has an excellent track record of proven leadership, both in the private and in the public sector. Ifueko is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria and the Chartered Institute of Taxation. She attended the University of Lagos and graduated with a first class honors degree in accounting. She went on to Imperial College London, where she read her master's in science in management science and Harvard University at the Kennedy School for an, a master's in public administration. She holds several awards and national honors. When I was in primary school, I had the unfortunate experience of being in a class with somebody like Ifueko. And they are always female. That driven, gifted individual who whatever you try to do will always come first in the cohort. Ifueko is that outstanding individual where in academics and professional life, she always ranked primus inter Paris in any Thing she set her mind to. She's a co-founder and managing partner of Compliance Professionals PLC and the founder of Restra, the very, very innovative consulting firm that brought Stephen Covey to Africa. Her, pers her past and current responsibilities include the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund, where she was a past chairman of the Board of Trustees a number of private institutions, which 
are Nigerian Breweries Limited or Nigerian Breweries PLC, Seplat Petroleum Development Company, both quoted on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. She chairs several high-level platforms on tax and is the president of the Queen's College Old Girls Association, her alma mater. Ifreko was a national partner and head of strategy practice at Arthur Anderson & Co. In Nigeria, she headed the Vision 2010 technical team. The first female executive chair of the Federal Inland Revenue Service and a member of the president's economic management team. Ifreko spearheaded comprehensive tax reforms in Nigeria, but most significant was her institution building capacity. I will tell you one thing about Ifreko. When she joined office, I asked her, what is, what, is it, what is it that you want to be remembered for? I don't know if she remembers this conversation I had with her. And I'm talking about as chair of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. And her answer to me, and her answer to me when she left office and I asked her the same question, how did you fail, was simply this. That to her mind, what Africa lacks is institution building. And whilst yes, we need the gifted leader, the courageous leader, all qualities which she bears, that her legacy to Nigeria is not going to be about her term in office. Her legacy in Nigeria is going to be about the FIRS when she is out of office. And to do that, if we could focus on talent, talent, talent. And I know this because I spoke to those who worked with her and those she left behind. Identifying good people, excellent, and not so excellent, but seeing in each and every individual the potential for them to be better than they are when she meets them and adding her touch to their lives. And so the FIRS which she led has continued to go from one level to another higher level. And I do pray that those foundations that she has left in the FIRS that makes it one of the most sought after institutions to run in Africa today will never be shaken. Ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, with great pride, I invite my dear sister and the 2019-2020 AIG Visiting Fellow of Practice at the Blavakmi School of Government, Mrs. Ifweko Omoigo Okwaru to deliver her fellowship lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ike. I don't know what to say, but thank you. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Nairi, for all that you've done. Um, but let me um, formally thank um, um, the Africa Initiative for Governance and the Babatnik School of Government, led by Ike J and Nairi as Dean, for this opportunity to do what I love doing best. There's nothing better than being told to do what you really want to do. And that is, reflections and being of service, expanding the learning frontiers, not just for Nigeria, but for the world. Little did I know that in taking on the FRS opportunity, it would become a reference point and a crystallization of all that I had learned in life. It would become one that we'll talk about and I'm actually quite private, people don't know. And so being thrust in the public arena sometimes does get uncomfortable. But what keeps one going is the fact that you're providing service and you're able to learn from it. I'm forever indebted to President Obushagno Basinger, who interestingly is also the chairman, coincidentally, of the Africa Initiative for Governance and his team who identified, gave me the opportunity and stood by me. I was single, female, young, 41 years of age. Sometimes I wonder myself. And without any experience working in the public sector. What I believe I had going was a track record 
that will come to play in a new role. I also thank all the other presidents I worked with after President Obasanjo left office, after his second term. Specifically, President Umaru Yaradua and President Goodluck Jonathan for believing in my service and keeping me in office. Continuity matters. If my stay had been interrupted, my story may be different. Passing the button and enabling me do that, not allowing it to fall and making the race after faster and even better than the last is for me a critical success factor in the delivery of public service. My objectives with this lecture, the short version of a more detailed paper, are one, to demystify public service. Um, in my view, the difference between public and private service is that one is in the public eye and the other is in a more contained environment. Even then, it depends on the sector. Because in certain private environments, you do have multiple stakeholders and you do have accountabilities to the public. And, and basically, my message would be that they're very similar, aside from the magnitude and the scale. And in both instances, what's most important is service. The second objective I'd like to pass on is that you can achieve your goal no matter the terrain, no matter how difficult you feel the terrain is, no matter how overwhelmed you may feel, no matter how you feel you're going into an unknown, it is possible if you're determined, if you're focused, and again, if you employ the processes I hope worked for me and I hope will work for you in getting you to your goal. But it takes a lot of strategic thinking, timing matters, your team, trust. And the trust I talk here is consistency in the processes that you employ that are fair and objective to all. It also involves ensuring that you build capacity to execute. But an aspect of service that people seldom talk about is a personal sacrifice that it involves and the doggedness to make it happen, even amidst complaints, even amidst frustrations, even sometimes amidst people who downright just look at you and say, I'm not going to support you. Results don't just happen, you make them happen. The third message I hope I'll be able to also pass across is that as a person expected to achieve that goal leading the institution, your readiness for the job at that particular time, how you frame your thinking and goals, determining what you can or cannot do, and how you embrace the people around you matters. It matters in keeping you focused on achieving the goal set. If you're not ready for a job, become ready and wait until you are or don't take the job if you truly want to achieve an impact because it's so important that you align your person to the job at hand. Be ready to always challenge your thinking, listen, reflect, communicate to your diverse stakeholders and stay focused on serving all of your stakeholders even when you risk being misunderstood. Keep learning, and keep communicating. Before I go on with my speech, I'll briefly take you through a couple of slides that summarize the reason why we are here, and then I'll go into more detail. Next slide. I took this off the back of the newsletter, so please excuse the quality, but I just felt that um, it was real and it was something that, you know, and I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, the NGF newsletter for publishing it. They were talking about COVID. And uh, as you know, my um, time was interrupted by COVID. Some of you may have wanted to be part of the speech, which was canceled. I'm happy that 
COVID has enabled us to talk to each other by Zoom. But I use this to also summarize the speech because I hope through all the things I'll talk about, one thing that will come through is that we need to believe in our change processes. The way we also need to believe in science so that we don't get COVID and wear our masks. And, and this determines four personality types. Believes in science, denies science, doesn't understand science, and believes in magic. I like to also add to this and put in a twin on this for change. There are four change personality types. Those that believe in change processes, those that do not understand change processes, those that deny that change processes matter, and those that believe in magic. I sincerely hope that after this presentation, you will believe in change processes. Next slide. We're here because of revenue. And in this very tightly um, um, costed slide, we've tried to cramp the revenue profile. And of course, there are different ways the analysts could show this. But really, this was just to send a signal that the reason why the reforms happened was to drive revenue development. And if we look at the slides, you can see a lot of the activity from the 1999 period, a lot more, and it just kept growing. And 2004 was when I came in, and 2012 was when I left. And one hopes that, and you can see in 2019, at least rise has started, but I want to emphasize something even more significant. Next slide. And that is the fact that what was important and what we recognize and continue to recognize is that Nigeria has been dependent on oil and our revenues have gone up and down because of that. And there's a need to boost non-oil revenue. And so when I talk about our goals, you realize that there was a focus on growing non-oil revenue. And you can see in the orange line that that just continued to move on. And the, the um, black dotted line is a Brent oil price line. I can see how our oil revenues kind of go the way oil prices go. And which means when oil prices are down, our revenues are down. And that's why what will really enable sustainable development for our country is not to depend on oil revenue, but to continue to see what we're talking about today through and ensuring that our non-oil revenues can actually be there to drive our development. Next slide. I picked this from one of the literature we had. I didn't even change it. So this is how it looked then. And these were the reform objectives to increase voluntary compliance through a more equitable system, to strengthen the FRS, to eliminate obsolete and obscure provisions plus loopholes and laws, to strengthen our penalties and sanctions. And ultimately what we wanted was to increase revenues collected and yield to government, increase funding available for development and increase the stake of Nigerians in the development of Nigeria. Next slide. We had reform strategies to al align with the objectives with the ultimate goal of tripling our 2004 non-oil collections by 2007, but on a continuous basis, increasing overall collections by at least 25% year on year. We also had strategies to address this. At the core of it was to improve the funding of the FRS and the autonomy. And then we had building capacity, structure staffing, re-engineering HR processes, auditing oil, gas, and large sector taxpayers, because we knew that even as we reformed, there's always a chance that your revenues will dip because everybody is so distracted. And so we needed to focus on ensuring that that didn't happen. 
We also plan to strengthen investigations and enforcement, provide taxpayer education and services, and automate our collections and overall tax admin system. But starting with automating our collections, because very early on, we're not even having reliable collection figures. And we wanted to be clear that even for those that we're, coll we're collecting from, we could account for the collections that we were getting. Underpinning all this was an aggressive anti-corruption campaign and threatening the code of ethics, taxpayer areas and database development, and having a performance management and result orientation. Next slide. We define capacity building in a much larger way. And in a way you could say that a lot of what we had in the previous slide was really about building capacity. And my definition of capacity building is about improving an organization's capacity to execute on its performance goals, covering the legal framework and structure, people in terms of the paradigms of the leader, the capacity of the leaders. And by leaders, it's not just me per se, as the head of the organization, but leaders at different levels and working on that whole process of re-engineering how we saw things. And so there's a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions going late into the night. It's also about attitudes, behaviors, and actions, how we take decisions, compensation, reward and recognition, career development, performance management, and other motivators that we identified along the line, improving technical competencies as well as managerial and personal competencies. It was also about institutionalization and the systems we put in place, development of the human capital management function and the use of technology amongst others. And last but, least, last but not the least, there's something that we usually take for granted, but so important in building capacity is the work environment. That was so critical. I mean, one of my first things I did in going around the offices was to recognize the fact that you couldn't run an office where the roofs were caving in and you're supposed to be, and then taxpayers files littering all over the floor. Um, the ambience in itself did not even encourage the image of the taxpayer, nor even encourage um, the staff to do the work expected. So I'll just now go on, please, we can stop the share to taking you through what we did. But I'll do that in how it all started because I believe that the beginning is also important just the same way the end is important. I was interviewed for a job. Uh, many people feel um, um, perhaps it was something that I sought, no it wasn't. Um, some people felt I just, some people get announcements in the television, no, it wasn't. In my case, I was, you know, visiting a friend, um, a friend an in-law um, in Ghana, and I got a call that the president wanted to see me. I was looking for somebody that would run the service because my predecessor was leaving very soon. And his goal was clear when I met him to reduce the dependence on non-oil taxes. But we also had a secondary goal to implement the outcome of the study and working groups on the Nigerian tax system. He anticipated that I will have a challenge, that I'll have very low salary compared to where I was coming from, and that I'd never worked in government. And assured me that on those two points, if I needed you know, a better way of funding myself, there could be ways they could arrange perhaps donors to support. And whatever I needed in terms of support, it was there to support. For me, that was extremely important in reforms, that your boss is there as a pillar. And beyond that, the task itself aligned with my, me as a person. Um, First of all, it was driven by the president himself, so it, it demonstrated that this was really important. And it sounded really challenging. It also gave me freedom to operate, again, aligned with my person. Um, blank sheets of paper, take the study group, 
um, of study that was done on the reform of Nigerian tax system, the working group that was done by the another private sector group and shape the service how you wanted it. And there's also something surreal about the opportunity and my recent experiences. I was looking for time out of restaurant. I suffered some health challenges. The doctor had advised, you need to slow down, maybe change your job. <laughs> and guess what? I changed it to another stressful job, but a very enjoyable one. And also the fact that at the time I received my call, I was actually intrigued by the Ghanaian tax system and I was having conversations when this call came through. So I took on the job. I took on the job because I believed in Mr. President and what he wanted us to achieve. I took on the job because it aligned with who I was. I took on the job because I believed in what needed to be done. Now in taking on the job on May 3rd, 2004, I was appointed as chairman of Nigeria's Federal Board of Inland Revenue, as it was known then, and in that capacity, chairman of the Joint Tax Board, comprising the Federal Board of Inland Revenue and the 36 state taxing authorities. Now we have 37. I was responsible for driving tax reform at both federal and state levels. When I joined, FIRS had about 7,200 staff, 80% of which were non-professional staff. And what do I mean by that? They were not involved in tax administration, they were mainly support, or you had people who were deployed from the civil service and not specific for the FIRS who needed to go back after two, three, four years um, and replaced by someone else. So there was no continuity in that sense of having a stable core of staff working for the service. And it was a mini Nigeria, diverse in location across the country, in local, in different states, and the certain states in more locations than one, diverse in gender, age, creed, ethnicity, in all ways you could think of diversity. The only recognized professional cater within the service was that of the tax administrator. All other positions, like I've mentioned, particular professional positions, were either filled from the federal civil service like legal, finance, and admin HR, of, and, or junior staff hired by the service for clerical and other work. We also had several persons who didn't fit the roles that they were hired for. For example, we had blind drivers. So we were also recruiting people, perhaps for social reasons. Eight years later, FRS had about 7,000, 80% of which were professional staff. So we have turned the, the, the ratios around. Located in every state of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. To be a professional in the service, eight years after, you had a career path in different functional areas beyond just tax administration. You now had career lines for tax research and policy, communications, facility management, finance, human resources, information communications technology, legal, security. People could do what they were passionate about and could help build the institution because we needed all these functions to drive and build the institution. With this, not just were we self-sustaining, we were also able to align staff to their areas of best fit. This opened up vacancies in the service with over 2,000 new staff that came through open advertisements, testing and interviews to take advantage of the new positions created. And please mind you, in advertising for staff, we started with internal adverts to be sure that we didn't have, we, we had, we exhausted opportunities within before going out to recruit. Another thing we did eight years plus was we redefined who the tax administrator was to give staff an opportunity to cross learn and grow and power to see themselves as beyond just working in the FRS or possessing skills that can be attested to within or outside the service, within or outside Nigeria. The organization structure was designed to build tax administration capacity across all the typical functions in preparedness for automation. So for example, 
instead of having four, five, six different points at which the taxpayers were to, to, to pay taxes through, and have tax who were only specialized. Some people had been in the organization for 10, 15, 20 years, and all they had done was withholding tax administration. And withholding tax is not a tax. It's just a channel for paying um, income tax. So we created one-stop shops. So not just did it meet to the win-win to the taxpayer, convenience for payments and administration of their taxes, but it also a win for staff because then they could grow along different paths and understand the full picture of what being a tax or revenue administrator was all about. We repeatedly encouraged staff through the various meetings and sessions we had to be self-confident, believe in themselves, their abilities, and the sky was not even the limit. We had non-professional staff eager to go back to school and to do professional exams supported by the service to improve themselves and succeeded. We had people empowered to take decisions through policies and the decision-making matrix clarifying the authorities. We gave people confidence through, amongst others, the rebranding in form and deed of the service. The colors you see today, the buildings you see today, the logos you see today, the, the, um, the poles you see today, we're all part of that whole reform process. The gray, the red were specially selected to convey meaning to the public. The general public and taxpayers acknowledge these changes. It was easier to pay their taxes through the one-stop shop and electronic channels created. They had confidence in having people to report to if they had any issues. Taxpayers were better educated on their responsibilities. Taxpayers saw evidence that if a tax officer is caught in a fraudulent act, penalties will be imposed. And in some cases, we obtained convictions. In fact, it was during that period that we had for the very first time a conviction for falsifying a tax um, clearance certificate. We also encouraged the youth to get involved through our students' tax advocacy initiative. Today, some have chosen a professional career in tax because of the working style. There are still very many ideas ex that, that were not executed or halfway done, and a lot of work in progress. But many acknowledge that the ship turned during that period, and it was possible to turn the air fries in and indeed any other public organization around in a very disciplined fashion. During the wave of reforms, what helped us achieve all this? was that we had one goal. It helps to simplify your goal. Triple non-all revenues by 2007 and grow overall revenues by 25% year on year. When that goal was set, I remember, people didn't believe we could achieve it, but we did. When non-all revenue growth was largely achieved in 2007, we got 714.9 as opposed to 795, so close enough. Our goal focused on increasing collections by 25% year on year. We measured, tracked, and reflected on why our targets were met or not met. We had a three-year rolling strategic plan that drove our reform efforts through, a plan that involved all staff getting their views on where we were, where we wanted to be, how to get there. A plan that clearly set out our vision, our mission, our values, and our goal and goals. A plan that got the Federal Executive Council under the leadership of the trigger of all these efforts, President Olusha Gunga Basinger, to hold a special meeting for the very first time in October 2004, focused on one agenda, approving the reform plan in the first year of our efforts and in the first year of my tenure. Staff complained about meetings we held as too long, but it eventually delivered what we wanted them to. Plans that we cascaded to every department and individual and formed the basis of performance bonuses that were paid to deserving departments and individuals. These steps typically touted as needed to drive change worked within the FRS, a then unknown civil service institution that transformed to becoming an esteemed agency of the public service during my tenure. But it's important that whatever we did, we're built on the past. And that's also important. 
to acknowledge the past, to build on what has been done, because what that does, it makes things a lot faster. A previous Minister of Finance, Chief Anthony Ami, had approved that staff be given a staff productivity bonus as an incentive for achievement of targets at the end of every year. While this was an addition to normal staff remuneration, it was not enough and did not also provide the needed funds for the service. Another Minister of Finance, Malam Adamu Chiruma, working with my immediate predecessor, Malam Balama Manu, initiated the study group of the Nigerian tax system for a minimum period of one year under the chairmanship of Professor Dalton Phillips, which concluded its work before I resumed office. This study group examined various models of tax administration around the world and made very cogent recommendations, which are built upon, part of which stressed the importance of funding as well as the autonomy of the service. The Minister of Finance at the commencement of my tenure, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala, set up a private sector-driven working group chaired by Olushe Bikestep, then managing partner of KPMG and head of its tax practice, to review the recommendations of the study group for recommendations to government. All this provided great research and fodder for developing the strategic plan. Leveraging on the recommendations of the study and working group, Balama Manu, Dr. Konde Wale, and the then special advisor to the president and director of the budget office of the Federation, Bodhi Augusto, and members of the National Assembly, started the process of improving the funding to the service by working on the concept of having the FRS retain a percentage of their collection of the efforts, which we call the cost of collection, to secure its funding. These were the initiatives I met on ground on resumption of office and built upon. I also took advantage of the support of donor agencies, such as the World Bank, GIZ, DFID, and the International Monetary Fund. In the absence of financial resources, they came very useful in supporting the reform efforts. The IMF was particularly useful in technical consulting and resource support around tax administration and designing and aligning our organization to the way the FRS should operate. And we, of course, customize it, bearing in mind our own society and context. In summary, what did we change? What, what, what we changed, what were the obstacles? We changed mindsets from those who didn't believe to those who believed that we could run a public service as an institution that cared. And we also gave people hope in themselves and in Nigeria. From day one, my mindset that drove the chain efforts was to see this as an opportunity to bring development to Nigeria. And that was what always propelled me. It was about restructuring the organization and bringing a sense of purpose to every single staff. That helped in ensuring that in leading and driving change, I leverage on my years of experience. And it also helped in reinforcing my changing belief of the importance of inclusion, buy-in and alignment across the organization. And that, I believe, was also communicated. Another important theme that we changed was the whole concept of capacity building. And like has been said, my philosophy for building capacity in the service was a lot more than a traditional concept of providing training or just sending a few people for some courses as may be recommended. My view of capacity building was to improve capacity of the organization to deliver on its results. And in doing this, for example, the legal framework helps. So even in developing the Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act, and the manner in which we were developing it, the capacity of the staff and how to build the capacity was foremost in our minds. Autonomy wasn't just about funding. Autonomy was also about giving us the weapon to be able to promote staff where we needed to, to be able to reward staff, recognize them, build their skills, build their careers, and give them a sense of fulfillment and a sense of love. Our structural changes had capacity in mind. I've talked about the one-stop shop, 
and, and sometimes it may be difficult for people who were not there then to be able to understand what was done. But if, for example, you wanted to pay withholding tax, there was a withholding tax off it. Income tax, income tax off it. Value added tax, value added tax off it. You wanted to get audit, special tax audit. And the list goes on. So with the one-stop shop, staff were able to understand the flow of taxes in addition to the taxpayer understanding that all they needed to do was to go to one place to pay. We also use the design of structure to determine the additional staffing needs of the service, leading to clarity around what positions were needed and what kind of staff was needed. We didn't just recruit, we recruited to fill positions and those positions had job descriptions and in therefore seeking those who will fill those position were clear in our minds the kind of people, the kind of skills. And of course, if you're just coming in afresh, we set down very minimum rules. But we said that you didn't need to have um, a 2 1 or a 2 2. We just wanted a good degree because a, a degree, because we felt that that was a foundation for literacy and for understanding the concepts of taxation with the intent to build on that degree a professional qualification be it in communications, public relations, human resources, or tax administration. One of the things that the processes we went through affirmed in my mind is that the more there's order and discipline, the more opportunities for employment and growth are created in the real sense. So in summary, what are the achievements at the end of the tenure? One is a belief in the value of the tax administrator and proactive stakeholder management. Two, strategic management as a critical first step to change. Three, rebranding and communication about a new order and the need for citizenship participation in governance. Four, we came up with the first national tax policy, which has now come into a second national tax policy. I'm very pleased about that. And we also came up with the Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act 2007, that some would argue is also due to be reviewed. We had nine bills, five tax bills, five of which were passed. And another piece in continuation of what has been done is the introduction of the finance bill to be used on an annual basis as a way of amending the tax legislation without waiting for tax legislation, because it does take a long time for tax legislation to be passed. But we still have some tax legislation that still needs to be passed, and I believe that will happen in due course. Another achievement is securing a place on the international tax map. We were part of the founding organizations for the African Tax Administration Forum, and um, the predecessor to the existing chairman, Nigeria became the chairman recently. We're also the founders and the founding initiator of the West African Tax Administration Forum, and all this to build collaboration in the continent, Africa, and even in the West African continent. For example, at the time, we hadn't even done any double taxation treaty with any West African country, and yet we have companies working in those two countries and not being able to give them that um, support. We set the pace for automated tax payments, for improved accountability. And we believe that a lot of what you see today as the payment channels, we helped and supported those that were in that business. Because prior to our coming up with automated channel, it was new, it was fresh. And we're happy to have contributed to technology developments in Nigeria as a whole. We also introduced the taxpayer identification number, which helps a lot in helping to build our database and we grew revenues. But there's still a lot of work in progress. And some of this I'd like to just touch on. I've talked about the need to understand the role of tax legislation. So for example, the value added tax still remains to be updated and improved upon in totality. There's also a need for a revenue administration code to help in ensuring harmonization across the different functions of revenue administration in terms of how we play to the taxpayer and how it ensures um, harmonization in the practices and processes that are done and makes collaboration a lot easier. 
Having a truly integrated tax administration system that is powered by technology is still a work in progress. Elimination of the use of tax consultants to do the work of government or to leverage the inaction of government still continues as unfinished business. And by the way, my fight for that nearly aborted my tenure because in my second term confirmation, the first term under the law it lasted for about a year. Again, but I thank those who believed in me and kept resubmitting my name. Another unfinished business is recognizing the importance of having a credible brand as a tax institution. It's very important and something we need to constantly build upon. Another is to ingrain taxes in the mindset of the Nigerian from cradle to grave. We had the STAR initiative. We had worked then on professorial chairs in universities. We even wanted to have a tax museum. And we started gathering things so that children from primary schools could go to a tax museum and understand what tax is about in a nice environment with all the tools that you know, we use in the past and current. These all remain work in progress. Entrenching merit as a way of life in the way work is done. Very important. In our promotion exams, we introduced testing to reduce the interface of human involvement. We also introduced performance metrics, but this continues to be work in progress across board and also as a nation. Succession planning, we worked on it somewhat, but it's something we need to think through in terms of how we build on this on a continuous basis. So there are no gaps. So for example, the current board of the Federal Land Revenue Service is the board, the only time a board was set up after we, our board finished in 2012. So there was a gap of about seven years before another board was constituted. We really need to avoid um, such gaps in the future. And last but not the least, celebrating the heroes of tax reform. For me, it's my unfinished business. And um, I've been working on the publication and I hope to continue to do that and, and achieve that. A lot of people contributed to what we're celebrating today. I was the leader of and the face of tax reform, but there are so many people in so many different ways across board, within the service, in the ministries, in the publics, at the presidency, in the National Assembly, in the State House of Assembly, in the Governor's Forum. I remember the various meetings we had with the chair of the Nigerian Governor's Forum at the time, who all collaborated, who worked together to make this happen. I'd like to use this opportunity before I close this speech to thank these heroes. You did well. We're all working for one cause, and that cause is Nigeria. Thank you. I mean, we continue to move Nigeria forward. Thank you. Well, thank you hugely, um, Ifweko, for a wonderful lecture. The questions are just flooding in, and we have a few moments for you to address some of those questions. So if we could, let's move straight to those questions. Um, Many, many people have asked, and members of the AIG Board of Advisors, uh, former AIG scholars at the school, um, many of the audience have come down to this one question, has, have the changes that you managed to put in place persisted? How much of the reform has been sustained? You finished there with some suggestions for the future, but do you feel that a lot of your work has been undone or do you feel that it's still there? Thank you, Nairi. I would say it's a mixed bag. For example, the Federal Internal Revenue Service Establishment Act continues to drive the institution. And that was one of the landmarks of what, what we did that led to a lot of the reforms that we did. The autonomy of the service was critical in building the institution and that continues and hasn't changed. The funding of the organization has continued and hasn't changed. Certain aspects of administration have not also changed. 
So for example, the other day I came across someone who just walked across to say to me, oh, madam, you know, you will introduce SAP to, you know, to, um, you know, in the human resource function and in the finance function, you know, we're one of the team that you put together, we're still here and it's working. So there are those kinds of instances that haven't changed. As I walk around, I haven't entered an office, I've, you know, um, and just, just because sometimes you enter the office and, you know, it's kind of destructive, <laughs> disruptive. You know, but at least the face and look of the offices have not changed. Now, what I believe, perhaps maybe not understood, uh, but one of the things that we try to communicate then and still remains work in progress is the, the design of the, of the service. The design of the service was meant to separate the head office from the field. And with the field being the bastion of service to the taxpayers. And within those offices, ingrained in it is audit as an integral part of voluntary compliance. Audit is just a part of this work of a tax administrator. And, and, and so you had a returns payment processing, payment processing to encourage people to file returns. And then you do all the administrative processes. And then you have audits who go through a risk-based process within the office to determine the selection criteria. So you focus and you now audit to see whether the returns were right. It's not investigation. It's part of administration. And then, you know, you get your returns and revenues. And then you have investigation and enforcement separate, targeted at those who are not doing the right things, who deliberately know what to do. And these are people who are deliberately undermining the system. I'm not sure that concept was understood. And one of the things that perhaps has affected a lot of things was the way the structure was changed. And once the structure and the design changes, it affects the approach that then is taken. And so that aspect, I think, is something to still push for it to be understood. Another part of it that needs to be pushed to be understood is the, is the, is the concept of why were we recruiting? We were recruiting to fill gaps. We were recruiting to fill and support the staff within so that we're all together working as a whole. Unfortunately, because of the larger environment pressures, there's a tendency to recruit and recruit. And managing those pressures may be difficult for those who have had to be involved in it. And as a consequence, you have situations where people will say they're not busy, they're idle, they don't know what they're doing. So there's a need for that wholesome review of aligning staff to jobs and the fit. And let me pick that one up for Ifweko because Mo Ibrahim um, who's been um, listening to you this evening. And of course, the Ibrahim Index on governance in Africa is a great resource for everybody on this call to look at, to, to, to measure how different African countries are doing. But Mo asks, how do you attract young talented people to the public service of the kind you were just speaking about, given the very poor salaries and conditions? He then writes, please don't give us romantic answers, give us practical proposals. <laughs> I don't know if I was supposed to read out that bit, but if we're cool, how do you get the talented young people into jobs 
How did you do it? How should the Nigerian public sector do it? Okay. Um, in answering uh, Mo Ibrahim's question, there's a suggest there's a, there's um, it, it's almost like I have to fit into a particular mold because what I say may sound romantic, but that's what we did. So I hope I'm not going to be labeled <laughs> if what I say we actually did. Uh, because I hear it sometimes. Oh, no, don't give me that. It couldn't have happened. But it did. Now, what did we do? And, and that's why I spent a lot of time on capacity building. We encouraged talent because they saw hope. It is not just about remuneration. Remuneration matters because when we talked about driving autonomy and funding, it was to improve remuneration. But it's not remuneration alone. It's remuneration, but it's also career development. It's also, and part of career development is do you see a path? Do you see a path? Do you see yourself moving in a particular direction? I talked about designing the structure. We, we introduced functions. People had never had that opportunity before to grow and prosper and do things that were aligned to what they wanted to do. We had communications people doing tax work. We had HR people doing tax. When we opened up the adverts, they applied. And today they are HR specialists. We had people who were afraid to touch the, the computer. We removed symbols of computers from senior officers and said no more symbolic computers on tables, no more secretaries. Technology is important, you must use it. So you see a young talented person out there not speaking to notice changes. People are dressing better, they're looking better, they're happier, they, are, they, they come to workshops and engage with them like they know what they're doing and they say, what is going on here? I think I want to join this organization. So it's not just about remuneration. It's about implementing systematically a range of different things, working together, complementing each other, but ultimately telling that young, talented person, you have a place, you can grow, we will, you will be productive and you can see the outcome of what you do. And you are placed and you are deployed, not based on what is juicy. Or in fact, there was a time we forced people out of Lagos because everybody wanted Lagos or Abuja. And today they're, they're happy for it. So that you are, you, are, you, are, you are deployed because we believe in your future. When a young talented person feels that that organization is there for him, he'll join. A young talented person, no matter how much you pay him, who comes in and is idle will ultimately leave. And if we could, a number of people are asking a kind of follow-up to this. Uh, Chuku Ibuka asks it, somebody from the policy practice, a number of people, I think Chima Obina, who's joined us this evening from this day, the brilliant Nigerian newspaper. What are the biggest internal and external challenges you faced in trying to do this? You're talking about doing some quite challenging things. So of course we're quite short on time, but could you highlight internally what the biggest challenge was persuading people to do the things you just said? And then what was the biggest challenge externally? The biggest challenge internally was actually making people believe that I was real. Um, and, and so with time, with consistency, with just keeping at it, and also translating what was done, what was said to action, I think began to turn the curve. I remember when the Federal Internal Revenue Service Establishment Act was passed. Even though we've been having meetings and sessions, I had people rush into my office. You made you actually passed the bill. So to converting ideas 
to action, I think helps. And that's where time comes in. If you don't have enough time to do that, then we may truncate a process that somebody may have done so brilliantly well, but didn't have the time to conclude because you can't do certain things overnight. It does take time. On the external side, I'll say the biggest challenge I had, <laughs> I don't know whether there's one, but I think, um, well, I would say tax consultants. Um, in putting in the law in place, we have tried to restrict what tax consultants were doing. Tax consultants um, encouraging the institutionalization. But when I say tax consultants, it's not your traditional definition of the consulting firm, so to speak. Um, tax consultants, so there are different types of tax consultants. I'm not talking about tax consultants that are there to help improve systems, that are there to improve technology, that are help to improve how you do your risk-based audit so that you build capacity from that. No, I'm not discussing those kinds of tax consultants. I'm talking about tax consultants who rather give build institution within, you appoint somebody from out to do the audits, to do work ostensibly supporting the staff, writing letters to the taxpayers themselves, and then getting paid a commission on the revenues generated. They fought me and they almost prevented my confirmation this is the first time I went to the National Assembly. And I must say that that is where you also need the presidential support. And when I started this and I thanked them, um, I, I didn't say it lightly. And, and the truth of the matter is that in change, there'll be winners and there'll be losers. Um, the call wasn't for abolishing tax consultants in the full sense. It was really, we need consulting help to build the institution, not to take away from the institution. And people felt that were taken away from what they were, was their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. um, Adam Higazi asks, um, do, how much tax do governors and members of the National Assembly pay on their salary and how much do they pay on their allowances? Was that something that, uh, was came across your desk, Keith Fueco? Oh, something that came across my desk. Um, and I, remem I remember, um, I think it was um, uh, President Jonathan, I think, um, when he was running for election. Um, and there was this issue about, you know, you need to get your tax plan certificate, you know, and so on. You know, and I think the chief of staff will remember that whole process where we had to assess, you know, um, and get the tax credit get then because at that time we're handling the personal income tax um, for the FCT. That has since changed, by the way, because um, that is now a state responsibility and the federal cap that's that's always been a state responsibility. But because we're sitting in the federal capital territory, personal income tax administration was administered by us, but now there's a revenue service in the federal capital territory handling the personal income taxes for both the governors and the National Assembly uh, legislators. Now, um, again, perhaps another issue was how do you define the income of the legislature? Because they would argue that some of their income was what you call the um, constituency projects. So strictly speaking, weren't income, but monies paid to do constituency projects. So that, that was a payment as distinct from salaries you know, that the legislators end. But we also had officers within the assembly to ensure and pursue all that that was done. So in terms of answering the question, how much taxes, I can't, I mean, I'm not sure I remember what taxes people pay 10 years or nine years after. Um, but suffice to say that we started the process for ensuring that was done. But I can say that there are still gaps, not just for governors or legislators, I think for everyone in terms of assessments across board. Um, and the emphasis we played at that time was getting people into the tax net first, building the database first. 
Um, uh, because what you didn't want was people running away, hiding away. And I think that's probably the posture that a lot of revenue authorities take in terms of let's get them in first and then we build, you know, um, in terms of the tax payments that are made on a continuous basis. If we're quite, in most countries, COVID, and this is another question, Shima or Bina from this day put, in a lot of countries, um, governments have had to spend a lot during COVID and the, there is an inevitability to increasing tax. So what kind of opportunity does this give Nigeria? What's the best case scenario for the Federal Inland Revenue Service? And what's the worst case scenario for the Federal Inland Revenue Service? No, say the cops, please, could you say that again? I'm not sure I got it. So, so COVID has plunged a lot of governments into debt. Tax looks even more important than it looked before in trying to rebuild economies after this period of expenditure. Obviously for Nigeria, it's the oil prices, it's other factors as well. But when you look forward from here, what's your worst case scenario for the Federal Inland Revenue Service? Is it that it becomes, it goes back to a day when it was very ineffectual, perhaps corrupt, and what's your best case scenario for the Federal, in Federal Inland Revenue Service? I don't think the um, Inland Revenue Service will go back to where we started from. I sincerely don't believe so. Um, I feel that um, because um, where we started from was so far, far, far behind where we are today. So far, far behind. Um, I think, um, we should take where we are as a base case and then we we'll build on it. Um, in, in terms of um, the best case scenario is one where all taxes are just put in some investment pot and used to drive you know, major infrastructure and that the entire budget is driven by nominal taxes. That is my best case scenario. And are you going to run for president to make that happen? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Good question. Right. Thank you, Nairi. Eve Wickel, before we close, um, do you have a message for the brilliant and talented young Nigerians who are part of tonight's conversation? Um, I think, first of all, nobody has all the answers. And nobody has a monopoly of knowledge or wisdom. I think in, in uh, driving any change process or in walking through the, any organization is to recognize that each person brings a strength. Everybody brings a strength. No matter how you look at it, there's something good. And, and, and therefore, it's to build on that good and then add yours, add your good to it. I'm not perfect. There are things I could have done better. There are things I didn't do. There are things with benefit of hindsight I should have you know, started much earlier. But I'm talking only about the things that I feel helps us move forward. I, and, and I think we should also, with that quotation also, take the fact that when we reflect and we identify things that should be done. It should not be taken as a personal attack. It should be taken as room for improvement and thoughts for the way forward. And, and, and therefore the young talented person should not get into that situation, expecting utopia, expecting things to happen everything overnight. There'll be disappointments, there'll be frustrations, but believe me, when you are focused on a goal, even with all your inadequacies, you will get there. You may not get there alone. You build on your network. You build on the people around you. And believe me, the people that you don't even know, it's important that you build on them. And that is why, for that reason, in whatever you do, don't rely only on old networks. Be fair and objective to all. We are a diverse country. 
And if you are play, play, playing in the Nigeria in the Nigeria play, recognize the strengths of everyone because they all have strengths. We all have strengths, but we also have weaknesses. And so in your deployment, in your decisions, you're constantly determining what's the best fit, but, we, but recognizing that we all bring something to the table. I also like to mention the last thing here, the last two things I said here. For me, FRS change journey was a relay in which my goal was to use my best effort to run my segment of the race. And even in talking about things that not so much undone that may perhaps need better understanding is because I probably didn't even communicate it right. And so what people understood is what they leveraged on. And so those that's a work in progress, but it's a relay. Leading reform or indeed any other organizational activity is a team sport. The strength of the institution is in the strength of the team. And that team is not just the present team, it's the past team and it's the future team. But once you believe and you have the skills and the capabilities to do what you need to do and you build a team around that and you recognize everyone as contributing value, you will impact and you will not take no for an answer. I hope that answers the question. Ifweko, that's a wonderful note uh, to end this, the third AIG lecture on. There's been a theme that has been very powerful across the three AIG lectures, and that's a theme of leadership with real integrity. Professor Atihiru Jega spoke even of the small things that build integrity. The first thing he did when he took over the Electoral Commission was to require people to make formal appointments to see him. Nobody could drop in and just have a word in his ear informally. It protected his office, it protected him from unwarranted influence. Georgina Wood spoke of being a judge and how when you enter the public service, what you're paid is known to everybody. So never to then partway through your career think I'm not paid enough, I must accept some other kind of payment, but rather to take on the sacred duty of the public sector. And tonight, Ifweko, you've given us a real vision of how by setting a clear positive vision, a clear positive set of behaviors and goals in Nigeria, you managed to really reform the FIRS. And I hope you are right about its future. And I hope that you'll be, you'll stay a part of reforming Nigeria's public sector in a positive direction. Let me finish tonight by, on behalf of all of the audience, thanking tonight's AIG fellow speaker and also thanking Aigboje Aikimokwede um, and his family for their extraordinary contribution to efforts to build and reinvigorate Nigeria's public sector and to their partnership at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University, which helps us to help in whatever way we can. Thank you hugely to you both. And thank you to everybody who's been part of tonight's seminar. I'm very sorry that we didn't get into all your questions and the detailed ones. I've made sure that all of your questions will get to Ifweko this evening so that she can consider those questions as she produces the written version of this lecture, which we will share with you all in due course. Thank you once again for joining us here at Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government with the Africa Initiative for Governance for the lecture of Ifweko Okaro Omogui. Thank you all very much and good night. Thank you. Good night.